Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to The Debrief, a weekly Q&A show from Sandals Church and Pastor Matt Brown. I'm your pal, Justin Party, hanging out here with Stephanie Super Sports Schaefer. What's up, guys? I don't know what camera I moved. Right over here. You yeah. moved. Of course, oh, yeah. we got Pastor Matt Brown in yeah. the house. Still not a fan of Super Sport. You brought a... Yeah, yeah a special guest today. Here she is, in all her glory. Yes, perhaps the greatest guest of all time. You My <laughs> beautiful, wonderful, amazing wife of 21 years, and we just discovered that we've actually been together for about 25. Oh, that's fine. So quarter, quarter of a century. century. Well, that's impressive. And well, it's been good. <laughs> uh, that is awesome. Well, Tammy, we're really excited to have you on here today. Thank you. You almost closed out your back to school series this last weekend. We talked a lot about nine different types of foolishness. I was going to try and say, so Tammy, we wanted to have you on here to help unpack those, but then I realized that doesn't sound very... Well, she married a fool, so... Oh, okay, there you go. We want to help you. Yeah, we want your insight on how to deal with these uh, types of foolishness on a regular basis. I've nothing for you guys. Yeah, I don't know. It's all been perfect, so... Okay, before we jump in that, we got a couple piece of business to take care of. We do. So we want to let you guys know that Pastor Matt is going to be traveling to Israel next summer, and he wants you to join him on that trip. And we've got info sessions for our Israel trip coming soon. So we want to make sure you guys head to sandalschurch.com slash travel. You can see when all of the info sessions are coming up, get more information about that trip. It is going to be incredible, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah, I look forward to having you guys. This will be our fourth trip mm -hmm. as a church. So we're super, super excited. And we're doing a little extension to Egypt. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's such a fantastic trip. You, so yeah, yeah, you guys have been a few times. I've heard from people who go on those trips now that because you've been a few times, you've got some special little pastor mat special things. Yeah. You, like you detours. Never know what detours from the field trip. <laughs> Yeah, there's stuff that you will only experience with us. There you go. So. Well, there you go. Uh, speaking of stuff you can experience with Sandals Church, the Real Workshops are launching this weekend at Sandals Church. And Pastor Matt, can you share your heart behind those really quick? I know this is something you've had us working on for almost the whole year. So. Yeah, so absolutely. So a lot of you guys, you attend Sandals Church, and some of you are new. Matter of fact, the vast majority, I believe 70% of Sandals Church has attended five years or less. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've grown exponentially the last five years. And so a lot of you, you know, you like the church, maybe you like the worship, you like the preaching. Uh, you think I'm funny, that's great. But really what you need to love about Sandals is the vision that God's given us. We believe that authenticity is a movement of God and to reject it is to reject God. And so what we want you to do is to come and take these workshops, three specific workshops where you're going to be learn how to be real with God, learn how to be real with yourself and learn how to be real with others according to the vision of Sandals Church. So you say, well, I already know how to be real. Well, we're gonna talk about what that looks like uh, strategically in our church. And then if you do those three workshops, you are uh, you are then qualified to take the fourth workshop, which is a fantastic one where we go over uh, a real with self uh, personality assessment that uh, has blessed uh, Tammy and I immensely. It's been the most helpful thing in our marriage. Uh, we've spent literally, I think about $30,000 now in training, mm -hmm. just learning this so that you know we can communicate. So learn from our pain so you don't have to experience it and learn how to literally better relate to people in your community group, family members, your friends, mm -hmm. uh, and really understand them from a point of grace because mm -hmm. we all struggle. We all have a woundedness in our life uh, that's just a part of living in a sinful world. And God wants to bring relational healing. And again, what you're gonna learn in the workshops is how Christianity is the relational movement of God where he brings relational healing to the self, uh, to our relationships with each other, and to him. Most churches just talk about the work that God wants to do in relationship between you and him. That is uh, the dominant part of the work, but it's not all of the work. Mm -hmm. The cross is vertical and horizontal. It wants to heal relationships both with God with self and with others. And when we look at the great commandment that Jesus gives, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's your relationship with God. And to love your neighbor, that's your relationship with others, as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of us need to learn why, why God loves us so much and why that's so important and why he wants us to be a member of his family forever. And so, you know, heaven is not about heaven. Heaven's about a family. God mm -hmm. wants a family because he's a relational God. And you will learn that in that series. You want to say anything about the uh, workshop, um, the specific Real With Self workshop that you and I went through and how that's been helpful for us? Well, I think one of the most important parts of it is just remembering that everyone's not wired like you. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it made us realize a lot of things aren't personal or, or just not being heard. It's that we process the way we would experience things and to learn that other people have different core motivations, um, the way that they think and process and what's important to them. Then you throw in family of origin and um, trauma, mm -hmm. life experience, that kind of stuff. Like it just, 
it's just such a good reminder that everyone we're encountering isn't coming from where we're coming. Totally. Mm-hmm. And then when you get that perspective, things feel less personal, mm-hmm. less intentional, less mean spirited, maybe. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's so much better to understand how to relate with people. Yeah, and just to give you guys just a biblical example, you know, it's always interesting to me that we talk to every person about being born again when Jesus only talked to one person about being born again. Mm. When you look at Jesus Christ's encounters with individuals, he treats them as individuals. And so Nicodemus is a person who considers himself to be morally perfect or at least striving for that. Mm. And so in that conversation, he's not talking about sin, he's talking about the the inability for a human being to attain true moral perfection. And so Mm. what needs to happen is Nicodemus needs to be born again. Um, But he talked to the rich man about money. Mm -hmm. Uh, He talked to the woman caught in adultery about leaving her life in sin. And so he talks to the individual as an individual. And so a big part of experience relational healing is not giving blanket Christian statements to all people, but beginning to step into the waters of their experience and trying to rescue them from drowning. And so that's that's what we're trying to do. And Jesus did that so well. And again, every individual is an individual. And this, I believe, is the best tool that I've seen in helping people begin, mm-hmm. keyword, begin the process of becoming real with yourself. Because- the truth is we are blind, many of us, to ourselves and especially to how others receive us mm-hmm. and perceive us. And so you don't believe me, get on Facebook today. <laughs> well, there you go. So the workshops are starting basically this weekend. So at any point that you're watching this message or listening to this podcast, watching the podcast, whatever it is, you can join the workshops. All that stuff's online, sandalsearch.com slash workshops. Head over there, get the full list. They happen pretty much every single service at every single Sandals Church location. We've even got them on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights at our Hunter Park location. They are awesome. And attendance at the Real with Self, God, and others workshops are a prerequisite for the self-discovery workshop that Pastor Matt and Tammy are talking about that is so, so great. So you should definitely check those out. They yeah. will be And let me say, value this is why, for some of you who just hate having to do anything because you just have an oppositional disorder, listen, we want you to learn why before you learn how. And so that's really, really important is you need to understand the theological reasons why God wants you to be real with self, God, and others before you begin to learn how. And so, you know, motivation is everything, absolutely everything. Why am I doing this? And so, uh, and before you learn how, because it's never going to have the impact if you don't know why. So everything we do here at Sandals Church is because of what God wants for us. And so we are motivated by what's important to him. And so we need to learn why. And, and if you're not bought into that why, this is nothing for you. That That's how I see it. It's just mm-hmm. a tool, but you have to want the tool. You have to want to be real with yourself because those parts of us that, there's parts that are super healthy relationally and there's parts that are really, un, like you have to want to be the best, most healthy version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Otherwise this doesn't matter. And so totally. those, those prerequisite workshops help you understand that so you have buy-in because unless you have buy-in, this doesn't change anything. It's just more information. Totally. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to five-star reviews and feedback before we jump into questions from this week's sermon. This question, this first piece of feedback, five-star review in the iTunes store comes from Andy44. That's right. And he titled it Debrief Equals Spiritual Debridement, which I don't know what that means. Me either. He said he couldn't resist using a medical pun that I think is lost on. I guess that's debridement, yeah. Yeah us non-medical people, but he says, it's also a perfect metaphor for how the debrief helps me to go deeper in my faith and pick out the sins in my heart and be real with my struggles. The podcast challenges my fiance and myself to have a difficult and necessary conversations with each other and provides us with an excellent way to hypertrophy our wisdom. Weren't you going to be a medical student? Yeah, I stopped when I realized I was going to have to major in things that had words like hypertrophy in them. And I said, I'll just do the, I'll do social science. Yeah, definitely definitely Google the word uh, debridement and then you'll enjoy this review even more. Yeah. Here's here's one that's that's a lot more. But it ends with peace out, one love, God bless. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Thanks, man. Okay, here you go. This this, this five star (laughs) review in the iTunes store comes from Jody Lynn, 1817, 817. (laughs) Here we go. It's like a delicious salad for your soul. Mm. Mmm. Nutritious and delicious. I need a minute with that. Yeah, exactly. A delicious salad for your soul. Uh, that means it came from the Nordstrom Cafe, home of the best salads in the entire world. Mm. Mm-hmm. They're pretty. They're pretty tasty. Oh, I love going there with Pastor Andrew from Sandal Church Woodcrest. It's like our spot. 
A little boys' lunch. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, boys' lunch at Nordstrom. Who's not going to go there? All right, well, let's debrief, debrief this. We've got all kinds of questions from this week's message we'll dive into. That's right. So right now, we are going back to school here at Sandals Church. And this weekend, Pastor Matt taught about how to not be a fool and specifically the nine ways that we're all prone to foolishness. So let's go ahead and talk through that here. The first one comes from Christy. She says, first, I want to thank you, your family, our church, and the debrief. I grew up in an amazing church, but until I was invited to a Cultivate event at Sandals Church last season, I was not not being real. I continue to grow in my walk with Jesus thanks to my Cultivate Pack and serving wherever I can, but every step I take seems to put me in situations with my ex-husband who's not healthy. My question is this. I try to limit with my time with fools, which was one of your points this weekend, but I'm struggling to make the relationship with my ex just respectful as adults and parents to our children. I pray for him, but the evil that I can see in his eyes, his words, his actions towards me scares me. What can I do to change the situation? Right, absolutely. The only thing you can do is change yourself. You know, I unfortunately, mm-hmm. Tammy and I have watched couples go through this for 20 years now in our church. And there's nothing more difficult than parenting a child except parenting a child of a broken marriage or oh, relationship. Wow. Yeah. So that's the only thing that makes it more challenging because it's hard enough to parent when you love each other. It's it's almost impossible to parent when you can't stand each other. And so you just have to understand that your, your ex only has the power over you that you give them. And mm-hmm. so you just have to just know yourself. You know, it's not gonna throw you off if you expect crazy. You need to expect foolish behavior from a fool. And, and ultimately what you wanna pray for is that your ex would get his stuff together because that's going to affect your child. And so your heart for your ex has to be, has to come from the love and heart for your child and, mm-hmm. and that hope. And look, you're, you're not gonna agree. Things are gonna be ugly. Then you throw in, you know, new lovers, new marriages, and all of that's just, you know, complicating mm-hmm. uh, just this absolute mess and disaster. And so what I would do is, is I think you need to establish some boundaries. And, and for some couples, you just can't talk. It's just literally texting, that's it. And if you see a long, nasty, nasty text, you just don't respond. And, and you just say, look, this is not good for anyone. We need to have positive interactions or at least neutral interactions. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like this thing with, with North Korea right now. Here's what we need. We need cooler heads than we've ever had at any time in history. That's sure. what we need. The same thing is true in your marriage. You, someone has to have the cool head. Someone has to have the cool hand. And so my prayer is that it would be you uh, because the consequences for a blow up are catastrophic, just like you know the reality of the North Korea situation. So you just have to understand the consequences of you jumping into this insanity really will affect your child. And so one of the things that we learn in the workshop Real With Self is we're all damaged by our families of origin. And so just know that divorce is traumatic to children, split families are traumatic to children. And you know, I, you know, I don't want you to pull over if you're driving your car and start crying right now, but you need to understand that even a healthy marriage and a healthy family can have negative consequences on a child. Divorce always has negative consequences because the, the greatest gift the child can be given is to see that love can make it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that's the greatest gift. And so when a child doesn't have that gift, you have to work extra hard and extra hours and have extra community to help that ch- child understand that. And so so just know that, you know, your, your kid is is starting a life swimming up current. That's just the reality. It's, it's a more difficult life, especially if their father in this instance is a person who's not level-headed and, and is mean and awful. And that's just unfortunate. And so anybody that's, you know, is is ugly or angry at their ex, you just need to realize what you're really doing is you're taking out on your child. And uh, and, and that's what you're doing. You, you, the best gift you can give to your child is to try, here's the Bible verse, as far as it depends upon you, live mm-hmm. at peace with all people. That's an actual verse that Paul writes to the church in Rome. And so as far as it depends upon you, live at peace. Now, if you feel like your child's in an abusive situation, then you need to go back to court. But other than that, I would avoid court at all costs because that tends to just make crazy worse. So, I want to, I want to add to that that I just I can imagine if it didn't work out in the relationship in the first part, there's some unhealthy dynamics at play before you guys, for you guys anyway. And I think that the more that you begin to show kindness first, be respectful first, at some point, hopefully, that it'll model to them how to do it, or even make them feel safe because it seems like they probably don't they're reacting the way maybe the old you and him kind mm-hmm. of navigated each mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. Um, That's good. And it may take some time to go, okay, she's not attacking me. We're really just talking, you know? So I would just I would just persevere and keep trying to do good. And and like Matt said, to the, to the best, it depends on you to, to be at peace 
Yeah, and so Jesus says to pray for those who persecute you. And I see, I think there's no more action where you can be more like Christ than to pray for your ex, to literally pray because he's probably under demonic influence uh, influence, and you need to pray that what whatever, because remember, anger is motivated by the devil. It's not motivated by God. James says that um, the, that human anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. It doesn't. You know, it feels good momentarily, but ultimately it's the devil's work. And that's why we need to take a step back and begin to pray over him that God would get a hold of his or her heart. And if you're single and you're listening to this, I beg you, this is why it's so important to not have sex because when you start sleeping with somebody, you get stupid to not have sex and to be able to evaluate to the best of your ability, bring in community, people that know you and love you and know and love God, is this a healthy, safe person? Because the best way to screw up your life is to marry a screwed up person. Mm. Man, well, that's really good advice and a perfect place to jump into. <laughs> Pete, <laughs> you gotta tweet they yourself. Totally Are we allowed that. to ring the bell for ourselves? I ring it for myself oh, yeah. because That's probably Stephanie the third is. time he's rung the bell. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're going to jump right into the nine types. You were just talking about anger. There's nine different types of foolishness that we can be prone to that Pastor Matt walked through in the sermon this last weekend. And uh, the very first of those was anger. That's right. And you use this verse in your message this week in Pastor Matt from Proverbs 12. It says, a fool is quick tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. Can you explain how exactly does wisdom help us better navigate anger? Right. So anger is driven by emotions, uh, self-focused emotion. Uh, Tammy and I were talking about this yesterday in the car. So so w when anger explodes, it's because I'm totally focused on how I'm feeling and, and what I'm sensing in the experience. So what wisdom allows me to do is it allows me to incorporate what's happening in somebody else's life, what's going on. It allows me to be empathetic to someone else. And so oftentimes uh, explosive anger is very narcissistic. It's very about the self. So I, I have road rage because I feel like I'm the center of the freeway and you're not the center of the freeway. We all have to work together and act together. And so, um, you know, I don't know what's happening in this person's life who cut me off. I mean, they might, you know, just be coming from the doctor's office where they found out they had cancer or, you know, they just got in a fight with their spouse or they have a kid that's got hurt and they're rushing or, or the boss said, if they're one minute late, they're going to be fired. You have no idea what's going on in this person's life. And so to me, what my anger does is it causes me to look at my heart. And so the last time I, I really felt like I had some explosive anger was when we were in Hawaii and um, somebody cut me off surfing. And here we are in paradise surfing. And I just got super irritated and I actually smacked the water and split, sprayed this other man in the face. <laughs> it was really pedantic and I'm not proud of it. And as soon as I did it, I said, I'm so sorry. That's ridiculous. Let's just, you know, mahalo, bro. My apologies. And he's like, no, I'm sorry. I cut you off, whatever. And then we actually started talking. But I, I paddled back in and I told Tammy, I was like, wow, I've really got to process some stuff here because, you know, what came out there was not healthy and I need to, I need to look at my, my own heart and my own self. And so, again, unhealthy anger is completely self-focused. Wisdom allows me to incorporate, okay, what's happening around me? What is God doing? What is someone else doing? And how do I need to fit into that? And almost all unhealthy uh, anger outbursts are really, really self-focused. I'm not getting what I want. And it's a reaction to the fact that the world's not perfect. Well, guess what? It's not perfect. It ain't. And so if you're this one personality style, you want the world to be perfect. Guess what? It's not, you're not, I'm not, nobody else is. And so as long as you have the expectation, remember we talked about in our series on happiness that the best way to be happy is to lower your expectations um, to a place where it's it, it's acceptable and, and it can actually happen. Mm -hmm. And so people who have unrealistic expectations, I actually read this um article this week on uh, Michael Phelps, who came out and admitted that he's been suicidal and he's depressed and he's struggling. Mm -hmm. And in the article on ESPN, it said that a lot of ultra athletes struggle because what they're striving for is not attainable and that's mm -hmm. perfection. So you, you look at Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympic athlete in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. And he is struggling with, he's not, he's not what he wants to be. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as perfect. Nobody's gold all the time. And so when you have those expectations that are unrealistic, even when you're the very best at your, at your whatever it is that you're doing, that's gonna destroy you. And eventually anger turns in on yourself. And that's why, you know, Paul says in Ephesians, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Because when you let the sun go down on your anger, he says, you give the devil a foothold in your life. Inner, anger is dark energy. And when you allow dark energy into your life, you're allowing the devil into your life. And mm -hmm. so what we need to do is we need to hand the angry things in our life over to God because God is the only one who can handle anger and remain righteous. Mm -hmm. He's the only one. So, 
And I, I think another side to that coin is like anger is a core sin, but when it comes to emotions, it's a secondary emotion. Mm-hmm. And so the point of this is, right, uh, identifying my own foolishness. So thinking what's going on under the anger, because they say it masks something else. Like, are you angry because you felt scared or mm-hmm. you felt insignificant or you felt um, at risk relationally mm-hmm. or like what is actually going on? Because as an emotion, it's a mask for something much deeper. Mm-hmm. And you'll make decisions based on anger that actually are the antithesis of what your goal would be. Like, I want to feel secure, but then, and I'm feeling insecure, you lash out. Well, now there is brokenness because your anger. So I think to really look a little bit, like ask yourself that Mm -hmm. reflective of like, what am I actually feeling? I just felt scared. I just felt lonely. I'm afraid I'm being left. I'm afraid I wasn't good enough. I'm, um, it's usually a secondary emotion Mm -hmm that leads you, that that's ruled by that course in. You know, that reminds me of something I heard this last week that's been really, like I've been really reflecting on, which said the space between a trigger, you know, like getting cut off on the surfboard or somebody mm-hmm. says something hurtful, the space between a trigger and response is freedom. Like your freedom to choose how mm-hmm. you respond. And you can actually increase that space by learning to know yourself better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that what that's exactly what you're just saying, that the more you know what maybe is your core feeling, mm-hmm. you can maybe change how you're responding. Yeah, really absolutely. Good. You know, Bob Goff says, um, he's one of Tammy and I's friends. He wrote a great book called Love Does. Uh, he says, everyone is a reaction to something. Mm-hmm. Be a beautiful reaction. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're all gonna react in a certain way. And so here's, you know, as we look at these nine personality types, what this means is typically your reaction is going to be one of these. So, yeah. it, you know, so if you're a person who struggles with anger, your reaction is going to be anger. And so you're gonna have to work really, really hard to be a beautiful reaction to that. But it might be laziness, lust, lying. Um, it, it might be many of those things. And so um, really, really dig deep, know yourself, and um, you can uh, over time work through those issues. Well, and that's the thing with all nine of these is that, you know, each of us is going to have a propensity to do one or another more often. Like there's some of these we're going to go through today. They're like, they're just not my bend. I don't have to spend a lot of time trying really hard not to react in that way. Right. Um, Because it's not my thing, which the beautiful thing about this is identifying what is yours, Mm -hmm. not in a place of shame or embarrassment, but now you know where to start. Mm -hmm. Now you know how to guard yourself. Now you know where to spend time when when that thing is coming to the surface. Totally. All right, so the second um, core struggle really is pride. And that comes from, really you talked about, like the second person is a helper. They want to be helpful. So why is it that people who are naturally helpers tend to be more prone to pride? Yeah, and so, you know, again, I want to encourage you to take the workshop. So this person helps, and, and the issue of sin is not the helping, it's the motivation. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes people with pride need to be needed, and that's the deep need here is I need people to need me. And so um, my reaction to people and my anger towards people and my um, just my hurt feelings comes from a place of, oh, they don't need me. Or, and there's another way to translate, they don't appreciate what I do. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta be really, really careful. Um, You know, I I lost a good friend this week uh, to suicide or last week. And I think he was a a two and he was, man, wouldn't you agree, baby? He's just a great helper. I mean, Mm -hmm. he helped everybody all the time, but in the end, he felt very, very upset because ultimately, and this wasn't the sole cause, but one of the causes was he didn't feel appreciated for everything that he was doing. And man, that that's just, you, you really, really got to ask yourself, why? Why am I doing this? If, I, if I'm doing this for the applause, if I'm doing this for the appreciation, well, good luck. You're going to be, I mean, don't don't become a parent to be appreciated, right, babe? I mean, <laughs> I mean, t- hi Kennedy. Kid, I know yeah, she listens kids, to this. Yeah, kids do not appreciate <laughs> things. Uh, maybe once a year on Mo- Mother's Day, right? And they write a one sentence card because I guilted him yeah, into it. So, <laughs> but your motivation as a Christian has to be because it's right, good, and true, mm-hmm. and that's why you need to do it. Um, and so, yeah, so prideful people really, really feel like everyone should need them. I had a, a really, really good friend, close friend on staff that this was their core struggle. And it drove me crazy because the way they loved me was really controlling me and trying to tell me what to do all the time because they needed me to need them. And the reality is I didn't need them to do those things. I didn't need another parent. I have two. I, I didn't need a third. And so that was the struggle there. But you know, prideful people just feel like they know better than everybody else. And let me just say this, if this is your, you, you might in an area, like I might know more than most people in terms of the Bible. I didn't even know those uh, medical terms. I didn't know either of those terms. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to try to learn those. That's not my thing. 
I can allow other people to be experts. If you're a person who has a hard time allowing other people to be an expert, this is you. And, and you just gotta look at yourself. You know, if you're the know-it-all, you don't know anything. And so you really, really gotta look at yourself. So it comes out braggadocious, you know, like, look at me, look at all the things I do. So Proverbs says the prideful person just wants to be heard. They just want to share everything they know. And here's the tragic thing, is you might really know some stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. But people in your small group aren't going to listen if you're prideful because they're going to tune you out. And here's the tragedy. What if I really desperately need to hear something that you have to say, but I'm not going to listen because you're just a prideful fool. Mm -hmm. And let me say this, pride comes before a fall. There's so many Proverbs that speak to the fact that, look, this is going to destroy you relationally, financially. It's going to destroy your marriage, your friendships, your church. It's going to eat that away. And um, and I think that's why all of this is so important is how are these things not serving us well? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just, I might, you know, offend everybody or push everybody away, but at the end, then I'm left alone. I'm relationally mm -hmm. bankrupt. And the thing about the person who struggles with pride too, well, well two points that I would think of. Um, the first one is that need to be needed, um, what can happen to people who really struggle with this need is surrounding themselves only with people who need them. And then their life is full of dysfunction, mm. unhealth, constant chaos. That is not good for anybody long-term. Like right. we need to balance. These kind of people tend to disregard people who don't need them, who might be healthier mm -hmm. and only surround themselves with people who always have a need, who they are always the hero. They're, which brings me into that second point of, finding identity in being needed. Mm -hmm. So if you if your identity is rooted in being needed, what happens when you're not needed by somebody? Does that mean you don't have meaning and yeah, purpose? Who are you? And that's a real dangerous thing to go, you know, place to go. And so always rooting for this person rooting their identity in Christ mm -hmm. and not in being needed is so important. This, uh, Kelsey wrote in, she actually asked another great question about pride. She says, I saw Pastor Matt speak at Saddleback and loved his sermon. So there you go. Oh, I love Since Saddleback. Since then, yeah. I've been listening to the debrief and have become addicted pretty quickly. Awesome. My question is, how do you pursue wisdom without falling victim to pride? Yeah, so here's the thing about wisdom is wisdom allows you to always know you don't know. Mm. That's what wisdom does. Wisdom always allows you to know you don't know. Arrogance is the loss of wisdom when you think you've become an expert in all things. And so you need mm -hmm. to learn to know that you don't know. And that's okay. Even when I read the Bible, right right now I'm reading through Jeremiah. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I was sharing with Tammy yesterday that Israel's king, literally all of his sons have been slaughtered in front of his eyes. And then after that, the Babylonian king gouges out his eyes and carries him off to um, Babylon, Babylon, which is basically modern day Iraq. So Southern Iraq. And so just processing those emotions and, and, and circling things that I've I've never seen before. And I don't know how many times I've read through the book of Jeremiah, but just not assuming that I know it all. And so that's one of the reasons that people stop reading the Bible. Oh yeah, 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 I read that. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. When I hear people say that, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like people have studied this book their entire life. And, and, and not only that, but the Pharisees had, so if you don't know who the Pharisees are, they're one of the religious groups. Think of Pharisees and Sadducees like Democrats and Republicans, but for Jews 2000 years Spiritual. ago. So they were, they were spiritual and political leaders. Um, they, they, they memorized, think about, they memorized the entire Bible. They were walking Bibles. Some of you guys can't find books of the Bible. They memorized every single word. And Jesus says this, that if you knew anything about the Bible, then you would recognize who I am because it's all about me. Mm. And so what is their response to that? They have memorized the word of God. And so they kill the word of God. Yeah. Why? Because of pride. They weren't willing to accept that they don't know something. Back to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you think you know everything. And Jesus talks about in John chapter three about being able to interpret the weather and yet you can't interpret the sign of the times. The Messiah has come, the promised one. And by the way, Jeremiah prophesies that this Messiah will come. It's, he's going to come and he's going to bring peace and he's going to bring righteousness. And here's what's amazing about the, the Messiah, right? He's both priest and king. He's both. And Jesus Christ is both. And so it's just important to always have an, a, a humble attitude you know, when you come to church, what can you learn? Oh, it's a story I've heard before. There's always something to learn. Mm -hmm. You bet. So.
All right. So the third uh, type of foolishness that we can be prone to, and Pastor Matt, you talked about that this is really an area that you've struggled in throughout your life, is lying or deceit. And the verse you used in your sermon this weekend says that the prudent understand where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. Now, you've talked a lot about how deceit really is lying to ourselves. How do we start to identify where maybe we've deceived ourselves and start to repent of that when maybe we're not even aware that that's what we've been doing? Right. So the three is the su- successful person, the person that's driven to make a name for themselves, driven to, you know, these are actors, performers, politicians, CEOs. You know, threes are the people that that really make the world the way that it is. The problem is they're never satisfied. Mm-hmm. And so uh, one of the things that the three has to come to grips with is their motivation. And, and the motivation really oftentimes is shallow because I am what I've accomplished. And that's not who mm-hmm. I am as, as a Christian. I am in Christ and so part of the thing was for me, the self-deceit was really being honest with how shallow my my motivations were. And not only that, but as a three, as a successful person, um, so why is deceit my sin? Because I, I create a reality that's better than I actually am. But here's where I really struggled with it, is I create a reality that I'm healthier than I am. And so I'm not honest with Tammy about how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. And so, uh, and this is why in our marriage, I would, we'd have these explosive fights where she's like, where the heck did that come from? And the reality is it came from me not being honest for months, Mm -hmm. for a year. And you you pack all that away and you're not honest with what's going on. And sooner or later, the truth comes out, whether you like it or not. You know, we can't keep the truth from coming out. We can only control how it comes out. And so, um, so a deceitful person has to learn to be honest. And so, you know, my family of origin, we don't talk really well about how we feel or what's going on or, or what's happening. And some of that's not just my family. It's just how God made me. That's this my, my per, As an achiever, I just tend to not be truthful. And so I, I've learned that's why I started a church, you know, to be real with yourself, God and others, because I needed that church. I needed to be in a church where I could be real. And if you've been to Sandals for a short time, I share things where a lot of people are uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, I would never... I would never want my pastor to struggle that way or to feel that way. Well, okay, then Sandals is not the church for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, all your pastors everywhere struggle somewhere. They're just not telling you. They're just not being honest with it. Mm -hmm. And it's tragic and it's sad. And and like I said this weekend, the greatest gift you can give to a relationship is to tell the truth, no matter what it is. And I'm grateful to have a partner in Tammy that really, really values the truth. She actually gets really, really wobbly when the truth is not presented. So it was really, really helpful to our marriage for me to continue to walk in truth. And... um, and even when I've lied to Tammy, what I've learned is the best way to fix a lie is to quickly come clean. Mm-hmm. To just quickly, as you know, as quickly as you can, come clean and say, okay, here's the truth. And, and here's what happened. And I'm really, really sorry. And, and I apologize for this mistake. Because the only person that you're robbing when you're untruthful is yourself. You're, you're, you're mm-hmm. not giving yourself the gift and the blessing of being set free. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you're a person that's driven, um, you know, if you're a person where enough is never enough, you know, you need more fame, you need more likes, you need more more notoriety. And um, that it's going to drive you crazy because enough is never going to be enough. There, mm-hmm. There's no such thing as enough if you're a three. And so you just have to be honest about that um, and, and open. Go ahead. Another dynamic to the three um, is just being very image conscious. Like image means so much. And so sometimes people who struggle with this will say to me, well, Tammy, I'm not a liar. I don't tell lies. And the way, you know, lying or, or deceit can come out a little differently. So if, if you're someone that's very image driven and that's, so maybe the deceit looks like omitting things that don't present the image that you want, which is still lying to yourself Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. others and, and how that plays out. So you might, if this is your struggle, say, well, I don't tell lies. Right. But think about, and, and again, think about it because it's in your best interest to navigate how deceit might play out for you. Um, one of the things I've seen in Matt is in, like he was just sharing that nothing's ever good enough. Like every time something that was like such a high bar or measure for him, he's reached, now he has, a, the bar switches mm-hmm. and the success has changed now. And so it's this endless pursuit, which is exhausting to the soul and your life and your person. Um, but the deceit and lying he did is, is I'm never enough. Mm-hmm. I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, so it's a self-deceit, but then it can also play out into the deceit of we're omitting things so that the image we want to portray isn't tarnished. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a real, um, that's a real dangerous life to live. Yeah. And so Jesus talks about the word hypocrite, 
you know, is our English word for actor. Um, it, it's a mask wear. And so Jesus says, be done with hypocrisy. Stop wearing the mask. And so the three really needs to take those words of Jesus to heart. I, you know, and I think there's another word. And again, I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with lying, but use these words, exaggeration, mm-hmm. minimization. Some people minimize. They withhold how they're feeling, what really happened, how that, how, you know, how that uh, ultimately affected their family. And mm-hmm. so there's all kinds of different ways of lying. And so we, we use that one word, you know, so like lying is what we do externally and deceit is what we do internally. And so you just have to begin to really open yourself up and say, okay, where am I not real? Uh, threes are gonna have a really hard time opening up in small group because they care about what everybody thinks about them. Mm-hmm. They want to be seen as a successful Christian. Well, guess what? Here's the madness. If you care more about others seeing you as a successful Christian, guess what? You're not Mm -hmm. a successful Christian. Mm -hmm. A successful Christian is somebody who's open and honest about how they feel. And so I've had to surround myself with community where I can be completely real and completely honest about how I'm feeling and what's going on. And I can't be real with everybody about everything. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I hit a real low moment and I called my, my friend, Mark Driscoll. Actually, that's not true. He called me because I sent a text and he was like, whoa, what's going on? And he can relate to me and some of the emotions and feelings that you experience as as a senior pastor of a very, very large church. And he just lovingly guided me through that. But people people can only guide you as far as the truth will take them. Mm -hmm. And so you need to to learn to, and again, I I shared this in in, um, church. I I think I shared it in every service. So I apologize, you know, because not every sermon is exactly the same. Right. So as you guys have learned, but- I remember the point in time in my life where I was lying to my counselor because I cared more about what she thought about me than the, mm-hmm. than the healing I needed. And that, man, that really messed with my brain. I was like, oh my gosh, that's how sick I am is. And again, I tell you guys all the time, the two people we lie to the most in our life are our pastors and our doctors. And those, right, those are the people that watch over our spiritual and physical care. And we mm-hmm. need to be real, so- Really quickly, before we move on, one of the things that I think is super interesting about this, I'm I, this is my core struggle, and in, in that I think is helpful for really going through this process, taking the tests, and helping other people speak into you, is truly discovering your core motivation is so helpful. For me, you know, you could look at me and maybe think pride or something is like the main thing, but the reason that that is going to manifest itself is because I care so deeply about what I'm working on or whatever. Um, not because I know that it's right, but because I want other people to think that it's the right thing or whatever. And the, the motivation there actually is that need to succeed or whatever. So I think if you're listening to all these things and go, maybe I have this, maybe I have that, there's there's very likely a root thing under here that's kind of leading to all the others. And like Tammy Brown said, it's a, I said your last name, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was very non-relational. Like Tammy was saying, maybe it helps you see. Maybe people didn't realize it's a different Tammy. <laughs> yeah. we, we are legally married. <laughs> yes, no, it, it helps you see exactly where to get started. So, all right, let's, let's keep chugging through. That's right. So the fourth style is, you know, really comes out in the form of envy. So going back to kind of what Justin was talking about, what the root behind that is, where's the root behind, you know, those who maybe are struggling with envy. You know, you talked in your message this weekend, like people who maybe need to stay off Instagram because it just right. leads to a dark place. What's sort of the root and the depth behind that fourth style? Yeah, so it comes from the need to be unique, which is hilarious because, um, you know, everybody always wants to be an original. If you're a human being, you're not original, you're derivative. And so what, what, what derivative means, it means it's a mathematical term that means that you come from something. We come from God. God is the original. He's the only original. He is the only unique, uh, oh gosh, I'm gonna use a word that nobody knows, sentient being in the world. It's tough to be that smart. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, Sentient means uh, sensing, feeling, um, conscious Conscious. in in multiple levels. You know, um, so so God, God God is truly the only unique. There is no angel. There is nothing like God in all of the universe. He is unoriginal and totally unlike anything else. So we are derivative. We come from him. Mm -hmm. And this is why we find similarities. And this is why this personality uh, assessment and and Real with Self Workshop is so helpful is because we share common uh, beauty and we share common brokenness. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't want people to run around and say like, I'm a three or I'm a one. Tammy and I prefer the term, I I have a lot of three in me. I also have a lot of seven. And uh, I have, as Tammy loves to point out, some eight in me. So, um, you know, and, and, and those are really, you know, kind of the, the ingredients that God throws in a dynamic leader. That's just kind of, kind of what he, what he does. You know, it's hard to be dynamic leader if you got a lot of nine in you, cause you can't get off the couch. Right. So, um, so sorry. That's okay. Yeah. We have a nine in the room who is dynamic. 
Thank you. And wow. amazing. laziness comes in different forms, yes. not just sitting on the couch. Right. We'll get to that yeah. later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't sin by doing nothing. I sin by doing yeah, something. Doing something. <laughs> I'm very active in my sin life. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, I was going to yeah, tweet that. Yeah, no, I, reach, I reach back. Please. I'm Somehow sure. I'm sure some blogger it. is yeah. going to love that someday. Yeah, that's Pastor that's Matt is perfect. very active in his sin life. Well, the truth yeah. is, I sin all day, every day. So, so I, I, you know, and which is why I need to confess more often. <laughs> Yesterday, when we were talking about this, I loved how you said. So maybe you can go as you said. I, I was asking um, about envy. And you were saying it's it's um, wanting what's no. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what I'm saying. This is couple talk. Welcome to couple talk. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> in, envy is the, is is really. I mean, these are our creatives, our artists. I mean, these are the people that really make the world beautiful. Uh, you're you're probably a four if you have a lot of ups, a lot of downs. I have a lot of four in me, so I'm actually a three wing four. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you know my melancholy nature comes from. So just naturally, if you want to pray for me. It really, there's two key times to pray for me because I have four in me. And so it's on Sunday afternoons when I'm done, I finish the weekend and I am emotionally exhausted. Look, this is why rock stars go and do crack and Coke and opium and all that other stuff, because it is literally an emotional high followed by a deep valley. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just have to just really, really get my mind through. And sometimes I have to just tell Tammy, I got to go to the gym and I gotta, I've got to exercise until I feel right because that's a healthy tool that I've had to work through. Um, and that's why, you know, like a rock star, you think, oh my gosh, that concert was so amazing. And they go do cocaine because they, they don't know how for it to end. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm doing cocaine, but I, I don't want to do that. And so I, I, I really need to look for ways to manage my moodiness. And I, and I have some moodiness that there is a four. And so an enviate person is constantly looking. And again, this plays into the three, right? So I'm success driven. So what am I constantly fixated on? people who are more successful than me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. I thought of what we were talking about. Okay. I was asking you the difference between envy and lust. And you said, lust is wanting what's not yours, but then you said something really great about envy. Mm. Nothing? We got nothing? No. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody had to be a part Pastor of Matt, that. Matt, can, can Tammy <laughs> Brown from this point forward have permission to record all of your conversations? Yeah. The point is, I, I say purposes. great things, but I forget great things. It was so things. good. <laughs> it was really, really good, and I was hoping to remember it. Mm. Maybe it'll mm -hmm. come to him later on. Yeah. That's why, listen, everybody, I... And you guys know this. Mm -hmm. I text myself more than any other person on earth because I have these great thoughts, and I have to... Or they're gone. Mm -hmm. They're totally gone. Oh, so, hey, you said two times to pray for you. One is Sunday afternoon. The, oh, other, the other was Wednesday sermon day. So okay. you got to think every single week, I have to come up with a great inspirational talk to motivate you guys not to go to hell. <laughs> Thanks. So think about that. <laughs> I don't want to go. Right? No. I mean, seriously, you know, I, I preached at a funeral last week where I told Tammy, the vast majority of the people that were gathered are, do not have a personal relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. and are headed for an eternity apart yeah. from God. Yeah, yeah. Not only are they living in darkness, but they are headed for eternal darkness. And that's heavy. That's mm -hmm. heavy to know. And, uh, you know, and then I, you know, because I'm a three, I, I beat myself up with all the things that I should have said or didn't say, uh, because, you know, funerals are brutal. Uh, funerals where suicide is the case is, is the absolute worst. Uh, it's just so heavy and, and so difficult to navigate that spiritual conversation when you've lost somebody that you love and you care about. And, and just let me say this. Um, I wanted to say this in, in the funeral, but I didn't. Um, Suicide does not end suffering. It extends it to the mm -hmm. people that love you. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. And so anybody out there who, you know, if you're a four, just so you know, um, that personality type is prone to suicidal thoughts because you're very, very high and excitable and very, very low. And so you just need to know that, that suicide doesn't end the suffering. It just extends it to the people that love you. And you are loved. And that's why, again, you have to be able to choose against your feelings. And so envy says, I'm, I'm not valuable and I'm not loved because look at this person. And, and oftentimes in our world with social media, it's so powerful where everyone else is presenting their successes and presenting their great moments. And we see all of that all the time. Mm -hmm. And what envy does is it lies to the soul. And it says, mm -hmm. oh, if I was just like them, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you will not be happy being just like them. You need to be happy being just like who God called you to be and relishing and appreciating the, the, the beauty and the uniqueness of how God has shaped you and your giftedness. And because what, what the artist does is they always find somebody that's more talented. And God didn't call you to be as talented as somebody else. He called you to be talented in the area that you are. And, um, you know, I've shared with this many times, I flunked preaching in seminary. And here's why, I couldn't preach like everybody else. 
I couldn't do it. It's not how God wired me. So what would, where would sandals be if I preached like everybody else? Yeah, not yeah. where we are. No. Mm-hmm. And so I had to learn to become who I am. And at a lot of churches, you know, around Riverside and now around the country, you know, I am the topic of negativity because of the style in which I preach. I can only be me. Mm-hmm. I can only be me. The gospel must come through how, me and how God has shaped me. And that's why I think a lot of churches are not successful is because everybody's trying to be like everybody else. Right. And you need to be like you. And uh, I think that's important. So envy is something that's, you know, at war with your soul. And, and, and again, um, not everything can be deep. Like if you're a four, not every moment's deep. And, and so that's why fours oftentimes struggle in relationships because sometimes it's just about taking out the trash. Yeah. Sometimes it's just about paying bills. Sometimes it's just about doing the hard work of relationships. And so this is why fours are great at romance and really, really struggle in relationships because relationships are work. And it's not always these deep heart connections. And what's those books you love reading? Nicholas Sparks, who, by the way, lost his marriage. <laughs> so, you know, you know that? He just I got divorced. I don't read his books, but I like his movies. Yeah, oh. he just got divorced. Hey, because you know what? It's easy to write about relationships. Yeah. It's hard to live them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. The other thing about people who really struggle with this is the emotional range, like Matt was saying, is so up and so down. And to really, you know, if you know this is you, that you your emotion, you have a lot of emotion either way, that you need to be careful that you're not making big decisions based in the moment of emotion because, mm-hmm. you know, we all know our emotions lie to us sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're real feelings, but doesn't mean they're rooted in truth and fact. And and so this kind of, you know, that's that's a real struggle, which is why it's so important to, to be real if this is your struggle mm-hmm. so that you are not believing every emotion that comes your way because in an hour from now, you might feel different. Well, now you're rooted in a decision you made an hour earlier when you felt differently based on your emotion, the emotional range that you're going through. Totally. Right. And so envy and jealousy, I mean, that's that's how the serpent got Eve. Mm. Mm. So what what did, what set her up? You you're missing out. Mm. You're not, you are not in, a, in and of yourself who God called you to be. God knows that this is actually block is preventing you. And so she was envious of the life that the fruit would give her. And actually what's amazing is God was actually protecting her from a life that lit, led to death. And he told them mm-hmm. that life will lead to death. And that's what envy does. Envy tempts you with a life that's not yours. It says that fruit over there, that grass over there is greener. That life is better. And, you know, I see people all the time with this sin walk away from their faith in God because they think there's a better life. Listen to me, there is no better life than the life that Christ offers. Christ offers the the good, beautiful, and true life. He says this, I have come to have, that you may have life and have it to the fullest. That's John 10, 10. There is no better life on earth. Now listen to me, there's no such thing as perfect life on earth. Jesus does not offer a perfect life. He offers the best life under the circumstances in which we currently live. And people who walk away from Jesus because they're envious of something else that they think is going to give them happiness are ultimately walking away from their best opportunity for happiness. And so um, I just I just wanna encourage you. I, I meet couples all the time who literally, we haven't been in church and their life falls apart. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're back. And it's just so sad. Well, good news for those of you guys who will, uh, you know, identify as a four here that need to be original statistics around this type system say that you already are. That's the least common type of person. So you've got <laughs> yeah. that, you've got that going for you. Uh, type five is greed. Natalie wrote in and asked a question. She, she said, what did you mean in your sermon when you talked about being emotionally greedy, that not all greed is about mm-hmm. money? Can you expand on what being emotionally greedy question. looks like? Yeah. Yes. So, so this personality assessment comes from, um, the seven deadly sins of Catholic theology. And so then later in life, we're not exactly sure. Nobody agrees because they didn't take great notes five, 600 years ago where the other two sins come from. Nobody was texting themselves. Right, so so, (laughs) um, the, the, the sin, the seven deadly sins, and so one of them is greed. And so it's this idea of withholding. And so what I would encourage you to, you know, think about greed is withholding. So greed withholds money from others. So that's generosity. They're not generous to others. This is mine. They're also not generous with emotion. So you can be a five and not give love to your family, not give, here's, not give physical affection. So oftentimes families where there's no physical affection, there's some fives in there. Mm-hmm. They're withholding words. They're withholding touch. 
uh, they're withholding. And so fives make great uh, professors, doctors. They're really, really good at hoarding information, hoarding money, hoarding things. And so, um, so oftentimes, you know, uh, that, you know, a person like this will make a great professor or scientist and they make a lousy dad, mom, whatever, because they, they, they have an insatiable appetite for more money, for more information, for more time. Um, you know, so w- like, for example, one of the greatest Hebrew uh, scholars of our age, Dr. Selhammer, I think was a five. And literally the guy could spend 20 hours a day reading in an office. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great but he was also a dad, a husband, mm-hmm. a father, a parent, a professor. And, um, you know, I, I would love now later in life, I think he got much better at making himself available because ultimately discipleship is in relationships, not in books. Mm-hmm. And so, um, he got, he, he got right towards the end of his life before he got terminally ill. He wouldn't go to lunch with me. And man, some of the things that I've learned and I share with you guys, I didn't learn in a book. I learned literally at, uh, CPK you know, over pizza mm-hmm. and a California pizza kitchen and just talking back and forth because he knew he was at the end of his life and so many of the things that I've learned. So this person withholds all things. And so here's the crazy thing. You can be a five and be dead broke. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so if you're a five, you, you know, you have things in the house that you don't touch, couches you don't sit on. They're very, very possession oriented because possessions give power. And so that's the five. And so um, they're very, very um, unwilling to, like I said, to give love, to give a word. So this five person can be greedy with their affirmation. So is that what it means to like hoard on, hoard your emotions, your yeah. feelings? Yeah, so mm-hmm. it's a hoarder. That's what it is. So, and we see that in our culture. You can be very, very poor and be a hoarder. You hoard things. Uh, Tammy and I bought a house a couple of years ago to fix it up and flip it. And this woman lost her house because of finances and the entire house was full of, what are the, that TV channel where you buy things. QVC, oh, maybe, QVC, yeah. QVC. Literally, she had quality and value. She had thousands of packages of unopened boxes, mm. unopened boxes with cat crap all over the top of them. I'm not kidding you. So she's probably not an important detail. It was an important worried. detail because <laughs> one is. of us, one of us had to clean it out. Well, it brought me right into the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Let's start calling this the QVP, the quality, <laughs> quality and value podcast. Mm. All right. I'm down. Yes, that was easy. You guys are pushovers. Can you feel like we answered the five good enough? I do. I, I think it's good. Just, I think with each of these, um, there's a little bit of redefining or expanding what your definition of that word is. Oh, yeah, totally. And I think that's what it does is most people associate greed with just finances or money, mm-hmm. and that's just not the case. Mm-hmm. Right, but if you think about what's the uh, the Christmas tale of the greedy person. Um, oh, Christmas Carol. Christmas Scrooge Carol. McDuck. Was, yeah, well, not Scrooge McDuck. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. But <laughs> look at Ebenezer <laughs> Scrooge's <laughs> life. He wasn't just greedy with money. Mm-hmm. He was greedy with his time. He was greedy with his love, with his words and relationships. Remember, he, would, he won't go to the party. He won't, he won't do any of those things. And so greed is all encompassing. Mm-hmm. And so that's the thing about all of these sins is they don't just affect one area. It affects all areas. And so that's why we need to learn to deal with these. Jim, who gave uh, some, you know, some of the training for us as we were preparing for all this, I remember him talking about like he would go to a party, but he's he's this type five, but he's not going to be talking. He's going to be hanging out in the corner. And part of that is he feel, he knows a lot of stuff. He's read, he's learned, he's smart, and he doesn't know if we're worth if you at the party are worth the investment of a conversation. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was an example of him being greedy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So this next one is the type six, um, and it. Ser- centers a lot around fear. And Tammy, I know you've talked about this being your type. And you actually talked about how when you first started, you know, diving into some of the self-discovery counseling and all that, that you're actually surprised to see that fear was what was, or that need for security is what was motivating you. What are some signs that you've now come to see are things coming from a place of fear rather than maybe some of the other causes on this list that we might blame? Yeah, it was interesting to, I know I've always been a fearful person. I thought a lot of that was motivated from some things that happened in my childhood Um, and when Matt and I first actually started going over these, I thought that I was, uh, had a lot of two in me to say that accurately. Mm -hmm. I, I would do things for people and I took the assessment and came out of six. And once I started researching it and Matt started researching it, we were like, oh my gosh, this is so you. So I had to start figuring out, well, why did I identify so much with something else? And here's kind of what I found with that was um, fear plays out for me in in every single way there is. I mean, I have irrational fears. Like, 
we're at the top of a mountain yesterday and there's all these hikers and I'm like, oh my gosh, I would hate to be up here alone because I know what all these hikers would do. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like I have crazy kind of fears. I go to places I look for, like I have some crazy kind of fears, but fear also plays out with me in a different way. And that's where that too, the helper comes in is if I feel at risk, that's a fear for me. Mm-hmm. So if I feel like our relationship might be at risk, then I will do things to help you because then I think that's going to secure our relationship and, and satisfy that fear. And so it's interesting. To, I, I could see that some of the other behaviors I did actually were in a way to get that security piece met. And um, so that that's really helped me to to really unpack some things for me that are really unhealthy relational dynamics. Mm-hmm. Because what if I do all of these things for you and then we're not secure still at the end? Mm-hmm. Well, now I'm angry and bitter, which is, what do they always say? It's just like dropping poison into your own bucket, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a lot of bitterness towards people because, but but I did all this stuff for you. Mm-hmm. We should be so good. Wait, yeah. we're still not good? Because your motivation wasn't the same. You didn't know you were supposed to meet this thing for me and just Mm -hmm. so then it comes back to the deeper question of where am I finding my identity right in other people in the security of relationship with other people even in the security of my own safety and well-being instead of being rooted in Christ and so the fear motivator is super powerful Um, I loved how Matt said this weekend um, for people like this and of course I wrote this down because it was for me is um, remembering that God is for me Mm-hmm. because the the natural thing coming out of me is that God is against, me. you know, the mm-hmm. fear is that he's against me, that mm-hmm. others aren't, mm-hmm. aren't for me, that I have to, yeah, fear is just a really, really tangly kind of a place. And as I'm growing in this, um, when I find myself, I mean, I, I can feel it physically manifest in me when I'm feeling fear for, even if it's relationally or like a real environmental safety kind of a thing. Um, and I, I've just, I'm learning how to ask myself some questions to keep me like, what am I afraid of? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the truth? That could How bad could this actually be? Like Matt will ask me like, what's the worst case thing? And, and I joke that I am like seven steps to we're all going to die everywhere <laughs> always. Um, at, least Ke- at least Kevin Bacon's only six steps away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you get to meet him before the world ends. <laughs> but you know, and, and walking myself through what is the worst thing, even relationally, what's the worst thing that maybe we're not friends anymore? Well, what's the worst thing in that? I'm still going to go on. They're still going to go on. I'm going to be okay. I have other, you know, like mm-hmm. um, fear is, Matt's laughing. because Yeah, like, every time geez. somebody gets mad, leaves the churches, she's like, Sandals is done. I'm like, there's like 10,000 people at Sandals. <laughs> we can lose one or two. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm um, serious, every time. <laughs> It's, it's a real thing. So I don't know if that answered the question, but I think the healthy response to fear is to ask yourself, is to find ways to ask yourself questions of what's really going on here, what's mm-hmm. really going to happen. Um, and, and for me, I had to figure out what are some other ways I'm hustling in life mm-hmm. to get that security met that are really unhealthy for me. Um, they were, I, I felt I was been exhausted mm-hmm. relationally, spiritually, because I'm trying to keep every plate spinning because I'm afraid one might drop. Mm-hmm. And the truth is they're going to drop. They drop anyway. And so I, I've become much more focused on the few plates that I, I don't want to drop, which is my marriage, my relationship, with my kids, um, Matt and I's closest community. And that's much more manageable than being afraid of every person leaving my life, leaving our church, you know, um, being disappointed because, you know, fear can drive you to be a real people pleaser. Yeah. And, uh, well, I love how you're, you, you know, coming back to the core motivation of this fear and looking at the others, you know, the same statistics about these types or whatever say that maybe over 50% of mm-hmm. people um, would self-identify or not self-identify, but actually would this have the same core motivation. Mm-hmm. So it's really helpful to look and Well, it's why our media it is the way that it is. Yeah. So mm-hmm. media is playing to this hand of all these people who feel like we're all going to die. Yeah. Interesting. So, and that's, you yeah. know, news at 11, right? Yeah. So all, sixes are great news watchers because it reinforces how they feel. And so if mm-hmm. you're a six, I want you to memorize this. The world is not safe and never will be, but God is safe and always will be. Mm-hmm. You just need to remind yourself of that. I'm so, going to ring the bell. Yeah, so, <laughs> I've been wanting to ring that bell all day. <laughs> so you, you just need to, let me say it again. So the world is not safe and never will be. God is safe and always will be. So mm-hmm. just understand, and that's where we run to God. God is my strength. God is my refuge. You know, when I'm in him, who shall, shall I fear? What can man do to me? I mean, all of those things 
come from people whose lives were very, very scary. Mm -hmm. And they were dealing with great amounts of fear. Um, you know, if you're a six, 365 times in the Bible, it says, do not be afraid. That's one time for every day of the year. And so you just need to trust that in the end, God's going to take care of it. Um, even if something tragic or terrible happens, we, mm -hmm. we know the end. You need to spend a lot of time in Revelations chapter 18 through 21. You I'm need to just live there. I'm afraid of Revelations. Huh? <laughs> well, don't read, don't read if you're a six. Don't read the like, don't look at chapter, chapter six. Cha no, chapter six through chapter 18. Statistically, that's really scary. sixes um, carry the most stre stress and anxiety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, the counterpart to that is, um, one of those questions is asking myself, what, what does courage look like mm -hmm. in this? Mm -hmm. um, that's the virtue for the six to be pursuing is courage. Yeah. Well, and I love what you said too, Tammy, of how you had to learn that God is for you and not against mm -hmm. you. And I think probably for a lot who struggle with six, or I think even in our culture, there's a lot of thought like, oh, bad things are happening. I, I must be being punished for something. Like I think we have that like mm -hmm. fake view of karma. Mm -hmm. Even like some Christians, yeah. I think we think like, yeah. oh, bad things are happening. Like, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. And to remember like, no, God is for me. He's not against yeah. me. He's not trying to punish me. Mm -hmm. And almost reminding ourselves of what we actually believe mm -hmm. in that moment, I think could have a lot to do with that. Yeah. So that's the six. <laughs> Let's go. Let's Ooh. move on. All right. Let's move on to the seven. Um, Pastor Matt, in your message this weekend, you talked about the seven type struggles a lot with gluttony. But a lot of the verses that you used to talk about gluttony were not about food. They're about you know our thoughts or our experiences. So can you talk about kind of how we need to redefine gluttony and what mm -hmm. that actually means? Yeah, gluttony is the pursuit of pleasure. It's 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 the desire to avoid any kind of suffering or pain. You know, you, you don't you don't want you just literally sevens run from pain. So that's why sevens tend to, you know, get divorced a little quicker because, oh my gosh, this couldn't be love if it's hard work or whatever. So they have a hard time oftentimes staying in careers, doing things like that because they, they want to run to pleasure. They want to run to fun. And so um, gluttony is just this pursuit of pleasure when what we need to pursue is God. So, mm -hmm. you know, a great verse for you is Psalm 16, seven, at the right hand of God is pleasures forevermore. Mm -hmm. So we need to pursue God. We need to reach out to him and go to him because ultimately we find satisfaction in him and the ultimate pleasures. You remember God is the author of pleasure. Sin is the author of pain and we need to run to him. And so here's the tragic thing for the seven. Oftentimes in running to pleasure, what they actually do is invoke more pain mm -hmm. and more suffering. I mean, what happens if you eat too much? You get sick, you throw up. What happens if you drink too much? I mean, life, the, this person oftentimes can become addicted to things very, very quickly. And it doesn't have to be alcohol or uh, porn. It can be video games. It's just this this d desire and drive to entertain all day long. And so what they want is they want their senses stimulated constantly. And so it's sevens, fellow. yeah, sevens have a hard time, you know, with church. It's boring. It's not fun. It's it's this or it's that. Sevens really struggle in school. And so because it's just it's it's not fun. Mm -hmm. And I told my son this all the time. It's not fun. It's learning you need to learn. We're, we're growing your brain. It's not entertainment, it's education. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes those two things are really, really confusing for young people. And so I, I know it was for me, but you know, uh, the gluttonous person is, is the pursuit of excess, wants to dabble in things that, um, you know, um, that, that, just, that, that just look fun and, and look appealing. And the, the seven's motto is what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know, uh, where this Tammy, the six, six is yeah. what could possibly go right? The six so, is here's everything yeah. that so yeah. if you're could a six, go wrong. I'm glad you uh, If you're a six married to a seven, awesome. That's going to be fun. So um, you, you're going to have some very, very unique challenges because one's going to want to party all the time and, and one is, you know, wants to build a wall around their house. Right. So um, so it's just, it's just a real challenge. And again, um, the, the, the proverb says, or was it Ecclesiastes? I can't remember. Let me look real quick. I think it said, uh, oh, greed brings, or no, we're gluttony. Right, we're gluttony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say something you said this weekend that I really thought was great is you said, like for the seven, there's such um, a propensity to avoid pain, mm -hmm. but sometimes good things are hard and painful. Good mm -hmm. comes from pain. Yeah. And so for the this person who this, this tends to be their dominant style, um, always reminding themselves of like, just because something's painful doesn't mean it's bad. Mm -hmm. And, and that's going to be a con like, I've kind of mentioned some questions you might want to ask for each of these, but for the seven, um, embracing, mm -hmm. not avoiding all pain, but yeah. embracing some of it because it's good. And like Matt said, um, this style tends to create more pain, which is, 
you know, ironic because that's the one thing they want to avoid when they're pursuing unhealthy pleasure, Mm -hmm. then it just just becomes this really dark cycle of constant pain. And then they pursue something pleasurable momentarily Mm -hmm. to avoid the pain. They just, you know, and it's just a dark thing. So to, to constantly be circling back to what am I pursuing when I'm in pain, like figuring out healthy things to pursue and not, not avoiding all pain because good things come from from pain. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, if you're a non-resourceful seven or unhealthy seven, you rob yourself of true pleasures. Mm -hmm. I don't believe an alcoholic experiences pleasure. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not drinking a glass of wine for the, for the joy and love of the taste of the wine. They need it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's sad and tragic. And so, um, you know, in the pursuit of pleasure, they ultimately bring just a great deal of horrific pain. And so just if you're a seven, just understand that you know, a lot of sevens have a hard time believing in God because how, if God is so good, could he create a world with such sin and pain? And so mm-hmm. here's what I believe about God is that God is omniscient. That's all knowing. Um, uh, he, he knows everything. He's all wise. I think that's a better way of understanding that. So God in his wisdom created the best world that could possibly be created with beings that are free. Mm-hmm. So, so, so pain and suffering comes from the freedom to choose that which is wrong because we must have the freedom to choose that which is right. And so in order for Adam and Eve to be truly free beings, mm-hmm. there had to be the fruit. It has to exist. Otherwise, if there's not the option for bad, there's not the option for good. Yeah. So God didn't create robots. He created sentient, there's that word again, beings that he wanted to freely choose him. So uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, that love is patient, kind. And here's the key verse in understanding God. Love does not demand its own way. Mm. So God could force us to love him, then it's not love. But if we choose to love him, then it's love. Mm-hmm. So that's why God loves obedience because ultimately we choose obedience to God over our own desires. And that's, you know, that's really what contrasts, you know, us, you know, Tammy and I had this conversation one time and actually we're going to, I'll save that for lust. We'll, we'll talk about that one mm-hmm. uh, next. But, but I believe God as an all wise, all knowing God created the best possible world with the desire for free beings able mm-hmm. to choose right from wrong. And so, and ultimately, you know, we get to choose our life. Do we want to be with God forever or do we want to be with without him forever? So, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's jump right into lust. This question comes from Spencer. And he, when he wrote in, he said he wanted to be anonymous, mm-hmm. but chose to put his name on here because he's learning you, about being the real, uh, about being mm-hmm. real and embracing that vision. So he said, this week in your sermon, you talked about the things in our life that are vomit. I've struggled. And I mean, really fought against pornography since I was 11 years mm-hmm. old. And I've reached a point where apathy has become a core part of that struggle. What advice do you have for a young husband and father who wants to be strong enough to exemplify a better way for my son and more fidelity for my wife? How does a man overcome lust? Yeah, so a- absolutely. And so let me just say this. is I-, I think that one of the weapons that the enemy uses against uh, men and women who struggle with the sin of lust, and my wife and I have had this conversation. I think that my wife believes that, uh, or not believes, but believed that me loving her means that I would never have lust for another woman. When I actually believe that what true love is, is it's choosing her over those desires. And that's what God wants. God doesn't want... Uh, me ultimately to not have any bad desires. What he wants is me to choose him instead of those desires, because that's ultimately love is saying, Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose you over all these things that I feel and want. And that's what the Christian life is. And so I think a lot of Christians beat themselves up because, oh my gosh, I should never have these feelings. Look, that's part of being part of our animal nature. It's just part of that. And choosing Christ is choosing the spiritual path over our natural and or animalistic path. And so, you know, I, I, Tammy and I talk about our dog all the time. You know, our dog has zero control over appetite. Zero. <laughs> like uh, she ate a dead pig like two weeks ago, like a dead rotting pig, you know, and she, she cannot stop herself. Right. She can't control herself. When I can see that's terrible and awful and ugly. And so, you know, but what she ultimately needs to do is not have the desire to eat. She, has the, she needs to have the desire to listen to her master. Mm-hmm. That is not good for you. So, so I need to trust God that ultimately what's best for me is not sexual experience as well as woman. What's best for me is a sexual experience with my wife. And that's the good. That's the true. That's what God wants me to experience. And so I have to trust him and choose him in that. I, I will say this. Um, one of the things that really motivated me is being an example to my kids. I think that every one of us need to see someone who can overcome a struggle. So having said this, I just need to be upfront and honest. Honest, There wasn't the accessibility to pornography when I was a kid. And I am grateful. I, I, 
I did not have mm-hmm. accessibility. The only way that I viewed pornography was at some friend who had a weird dad. Yeah. <laughs> you, I, you know, I mean, that's just what it was, you know. I, I, that's how I came in contact or a magazine that was at uh, on a playground. Nowadays, it's in your home, it's on your phone, it's in your face all day, every day. It's in your bedroom. Uh, and we have women who are foolishly believe they're liberated when in fact they've become slaves to the very thing that they've rebelled against. I mean, feminism in the area of the way they dress and whatever is ridiculous. They've actually, I mean, they don't want to become sexual objects. And so what have they done? They've baptized themselves in being sexual objects. And so you just need to know that. So, uh, you know, if you want men to value you for you, cover yourself. That that helps them evaluate you as with the personality and as the sentient being that you are. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I think that, you know, the first thing is, is you got to get 100% real about your struggle. You, you have to, you have to, just like a, a drug addict, right? We, or an alcoholic. Hi, my name's Matt and I'm an alcoholic. I mean, that's what they say at the meeting. I am identifying as a struggler and you just need to know that. So the first thing is, is, is admitting it. And the second thing is, what are the triggers in your life that mm-hmm. cause you to go mm-hmm. to that vomit? And so for me, you know, it can be a fight with Tammy. It can be stress at work. And so that's why really for me as a three, I, I thought, and I think a lot of men think, oh, I'm an eight. Well, I wasn't an eight. I'm a three. When I was feeling unsuccessful and I was lying about how I'm feeling, that's when my lust began to rise. And so as long as I fought lust and I thought that was the enemy, I failed. But when I began to address my lack of authenticity and I began to deal with those things, it mm-hmm. dropped because, um, you know, just like my, my sense of anxiety. And so what, what all these sins are, are these are the things that we run to instead of God, every single one of us. Mm-hmm. We run to untruth, we run to fear, we run to uh, lying, we run to perfection, we run, you know, to anger. We, these are our crutches that we run to and, and God wants us to run to him. People always say, well, I think Christianity is a crutch, amen. And I have a broken leg. Mm-hmm. So I run, I run to Jesus. So the first thing is being honest. The second thing is really understand your triggers, stress at work, conflict with your wife, you know, what's going on. And then the third thing is you need to do some real work because, um, you know, I've talked with my son about this. Pornography robs you of intimacy. That's what it does. Nobody would sit around looking at pictures of ice cream. That's weird, you know, and I like ice cream. So why, it why, is. yeah, why would you do that? Um, you, you, you need to I'm learn to- I'm just hiding over here with shame in the corner because I have an ice cream Pinterest board. Oh, it's so good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken like maybe a true seven. I, so. I think that the points about the triggers are so important. Mm-hmm. And, and going through all of this, I mean, we're giving you such a snapshot in this moment. Um, once, you know, the we're able to get a little bit more into these in the workshops, um, those are the kind of things you'll get to work out for yourself is- you know, part of, of um, what comes to play in lust is those triggers. Am I stressed? Mm-hmm. Am I worried about something? It, and, and then you'll run to something like this as a means to avoid whatever momentarily is going on um, in your life. But then again, the real life exists. And so those triggers oh. are so important because then you can know, okay, I'm, I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple things. One thing that you have talked about is... Um, like the root of lust is wanting something that's not yours. So it's lust is not necessarily just sexual. sexual. Yeah. And it's that's the lust for power. Yeah. And that's the thing that we've talked about is kind of a broadening what we think about each of these definitions. Mm-hmm. Like um, for example, I cannot yeah. lust after Tammy, my wife. Mm-hmm. It's, it's impossible for me to lust for her because God has given her to me. She's given herself to me. Um, and so all, all of my sexual arousal towards her is by definition not lust because it's something that, that, that we together have given each other. Now, if I lust for your wife or mm-hmm. for your husband, right? Though that that is lust. It's the desire to control people um, in, in, a, in, a, in an unhealthy, unlawful way. Mm-hmm. And so lustful people are drawn to power, power positions. Uh, and so that, that's where you, I want all of you to hold your number lightly until you mm-hmm. actually take the test. Cause I think some of you are gonna say, oh, I'm this, mm-hmm. like Tammy, you know, well, we both thought she was probably a two, but I, I think it's important to hold these lightly because you may be a person that struggles with lust, but you're just a non-resourceful seven. Well, mm-hmm. and that's what I was going to say for Spencer is, and I'm curious if lust is actually your core sin because totally. it tends to be um, part of that, the seven gluttony, the experience, the need to avoid pain. And a, mm-hmm. and a lot of pornography is actually, lust is not the primary motivator. It's the avoidance of pain, the pursuit of pleasure. Mm-hmm. And so um, lust tends to be a little bit more about um, desiring what's not yours, um, 
which could be power, money, things, the need to conquer, all those kind of things. So again, some of this is going to reframe for everybody what these definitions mean. But mm-hmm. I, I would guess that for this question and specifically with Spencer, that that uh, his pornography tends to have a little bit more to do with pursu- you know, avoiding pain and, and such rather than the actual yeah. lust. Mm-hmm. If, if you think about what lust really yeah. the core, the, the eighth core need is to be against, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to stand opposed to. And so totally. lust is, right, is, is the sexual desire against what God has ordained. Mm-hmm. It's, it's to be against someone else's commitment and covenant in marriage. I'm against that because I want them for me. I want these things. And so it's really a, an oppositional personality. Yeah. And and just so you know, don't feel bad about being an eight. I mean, eights are, are strong leaders. Mm-hmm. They make big differences. Protectors. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah. Each believe, of these has such yeah. fantastic value. I mean, we're spending some time talking about the downside to mm-hmm. help people start to have a starting point. But each of these has a counterpart that is, that is something that exemplifies um, an attribute of God. Yeah, I, I think given, uh, so. King David was an eight. Mm, yep. So, um, you know, he's somebody that struggled with sexual desires, Bathsheba, mm. something that was not his, but he was also a protector, a great protector over mm-hmm. things that he perceived to be wrongs. Mm. And so eights are, you know, uh, eights are powerful people that when used uh, for good, do great things. And when they become unhealthy, they become they can become tyrants. I mean, you can change the world for good or you can change it for bad, so... Totally. Hey, two, there, I, I've struggled deeply with pornography. There have been two books that have been really, really helpful resources for me and my journey out of that. One is called Wired for Intimacy by William Struthers. And it basically talks about what goes on inside your brain mm. um, and how to un, like how to actually undo some of the, like the rewiring of your brain. It's been really helpful. And then there's another book, Once I Got Married, called Fidelity by Douglas Wilson. It's about what it means to be a one woman man. And basically, you know, talks about one of the key things you can do to move away from uh, the engagement with pornography on a regular basis is just developing emotional intimacy with your wife and talks about some helpful tips on how to do that. So, yeah, and again, like for this weekend's message, you need to convince yourself that pornography is vomit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise you're simply the dog lapping up puke yep. and that's what it is. And so, you know- Such uh, a good visual this weekend. <laughs> you know, pornography is, you know, sexual intimacy turned into vomit. That's what it is. Mm. And so you just have to understand the dog believes they're eating something good. The totally. reality is it's disgusting. And so that's why we need scripture in our life. And, and I, wanna, I wanna beg all of you to read the Bible because the Bible helps you to identify puke in your life. Mm. And without God's word, we're all dogs, we're all animals and we just eat it up. And it's just so sad. And that's why, you know, the, the one passage about gluttony says that um, the wise person is hungry for knowledge, but the fool feeds on trash. And uh, pornography is just trash. That, that's what it is. And it's it's sad. So You know, I think that's one of the reasons I loved when you talked about that for, uh, I think when you, for somebody who struggles with pornography, sharing that with your husband or wife, like sharing when you sin um, is a really great thing to do. P- one of the primary benefits it's had for me is show me how vomitous it is through, mm-hmm. through like for Lindy's reaction. Oh, yeah. That's one of the most, when you're talking about that this weekend in the message, that's what I kept thinking of. Mm-hmm. That's what helped me mm-hmm. to see it for what it is. So, yeah. mm-hmm. all right, we got the last one. Stephanie, you've been really patiently waiting for us to get to the I ninth have, type. I have, So it's possible that I am primarily a type nine, although I have many. You have advantages. a lot of nine in you. I have a lot of nine in me. Uh, so this, the core struggle of the nine is laziness or that need to avoid And I feel like probably most people are not going to outwardly identify themselves as lazy. So what are some key characteristics of someone who might be struggling with laziness or that need to avoid, but maybe isn't realizing that that's their struggle? Well, first of all, the need to avoid as if when we looked at the seven, they avoid pain where the type nine who struggles with laziness, they don't necessarily, they avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to to point out with the avoidance pieces that typically is surrounded with conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I, I think that uh, one of the attributes of the nine is stubbornness. Mm. So um, they are passively aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's like it's like trying to move an elephant. And so, um, you know, nines will will agree up front, but not change. So that's- Because disagreeing up front might cause what? Conflict. Right. Which is a bad thing. And so <laughs> they will agree, but then mm-hmm. I like to say with the nine that the con conflict exists. It's very, very real. Just like with the seven, we say all pain is not bad. All conflict is not bad. Mm -hmm. Um, Conflict can bring again such healing 
in um, relationships. And so for for this type, and, and again, reframing how we're defining these words. When we initially say laziness, most people think of like, you just sit around in your sweats, yeah. eating ice cream on the couch all day, watching TV. Um, a lot of nines, laziness doesn't look like that. It might look like relational laziness. Mm -hmm. It might look like work ethic laziness. Mm -hmm. It might look like, you know, it looks a lot different than like, oh, you just like to sit around. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really hardworking people who struggle with laziness in those different areas. Yeah, the, the nine and the positive, it, it's identified as the peaceful person. Mm -hmm. And so the, the positive attributes is they see both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge for the nine is when one side's wrong and they, they have to say, okay, that that's not right. And so, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things. And so the nine is actually, I think, um, the hardest to identify mm -hmm. uh, because it's not, it's not overtly, you know, um, like you're going to love working with nines, being around nines. Like, you know, I, I, I love hanging out with Stephanie. Because on the surface, yeah. they're very peaceful, mm -hmm. like pleasant. They're yeah, not whereas the eight, you're like, you. oh my gosh, <laughs> they need to be out of here. Stephanie, Tammy Brown likes you for who you are on the outside. <laughs> I'll take out the surface. Yeah. So, so this is, I, I think the nine is going to be, I don't know, a little more challenging uh, to self-discover. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I think so. Well, especially because... You know, I think a lot of people aren't going to, I don't want to say that I'm lazy, especially because, you know, I can keep, I keep myself very busy. And I think mm -hmm. I do that a lot of times to avoid conflict or to avoid dealing with something relationally. So it's, oh, but I'm, that's so key is yeah. like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Yeah. I'm working. It's I'm not doing that you're sitting things. around and don't want yeah. to well, do Well, you have a lot stuff. of one. I do. So that, that helps. So that, yeah, perfection, wanting yeah. to do the right thing yeah. fights my mm -hmm. laziness. But I think, you know, Tyler and I were having some conversations after we have to sit down with Tammy and have a like <laughs> it was so fun. nine types, like, you know, detox talk. And um, one they, of the things they that, let me practice coaching on them this last weekend. Did. We did. It was fun. And so one of the things we were talking about after that was probably that I do avoid things relationally, that my laziness comes relationally. I don't want to step in and tell someone, hey, what you did actually really hurt my feelings or, hey, I don't think you should be doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, or even good things probably. So I think realizing like what laziness could look like relationally was a huge eye-opening thing for me. Yeah, if you're a nine, you need to aggressively share how you feel. I think that's, I think mm -hmm. that's the real thing because a lot of times nines feel like growing up as a kid, how, how I feel doesn't matter, it's not important. Mm -hmm. or, or, or I'll just get over it, I'll be yeah, fine, I'll just yeah. move on. And so you, you've, you've really, and that can cause you to really be um, bitter and angry at people who've kind of walked all over you. So you need, mm -hmm. to, you need to, like for example, we're in a meeting and, and you've been in meetings where I say, okay, I need to hear from the nines. Because the <laughs> nines are, you know, the eights, you can't shut up and the nines are not gonna say anything because mm -hmm. the more dominant personality is gonna share. And so that, you know, if you have a nine in your life, they have a lot of wisdom and, and mm -hmm. you need to hear that, but you have to create a non-aggressive way for them to be able to share how they feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, the nines have a lot of depth. They spend a lot of time mm -hmm. not talking and thinking, whereas me, I spend well, a lot of time and, thinking. And, and a positive of this style is that they see both points of view. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're recognizing where people are, which is great. One of the things, and again, all of these are for your own self, soul care and growth. Mm -hmm. But what I see in, um, the nine in an unhealthy way is that deep motivation to avoid conflict, how that can play out is you have a relationship, a little bit of conflict arises. So what you do is kind of set that relationship to the side and move to the next relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point, guess what happens? It's gonna be more. More relationship or conflict is gonna happen. Now we're setting that person to the side and moving our energy and attention to the, re the new, re another relationship where no conflict. Well. You know, that down the road is friend loss after friend loss after friend loss after friend loss. This mm -hmm. is like relational carnage because mm. you've avoided and moved to the spaces where, you know, in the moment conflict doesn't arise, mm -hmm. but at some point in every relationship it arises. And so then I see nines feel very lonely mm -hmm. and there's a lot of relational junk out there unresolved. And, and that ultimately harms them the most. Right. So the fours fears, I'm not understood. The nine is I don't matter. So you just have to understand that, that you do matter, that you mm -hmm. are valuable. And, and again, you know, nines way of dealing with things is, is, is easier for the rest of us. So, yeah. so that's yeah. why it's really, really hard to challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, you said this weekend, Matt, you said for nines, they need to work hard for the things that are worthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Worthy of work. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 
you know, I think there's a really, just where our whole entire country is at right now, just the climate of tension politically, just like in every possible way, I think there's a huge opportunity for nines, like in community groups, in mm -hmm. friendships, relationships, in work and all those things. Because of your gifting and ability to see both sides, man, we are in desperate need of you guys speaking up and vocalizing mm -hmm. and, and really helping us. Um, yeah, so for example, in a community group, they're going to be the most quiet when oftentimes they have the most truth. Mm -hmm. Totally. And so that's the challenge is, and so, and so this is what you need to understand as a nine is you can sin by not doing something. Yeah. So oh, oftentimes yeah. Mm -hmm. we think of sins as active, you know, actively doing something, but what we can do is we can actually sin by not doing something. To know oh, yeah. what's right and not do it is a sin. And so nines typically don't sin by actively destroying their life. They sin by not being, being involved. Proactive yeah, proactively. Being so yeah. Love it. Well, hey, you know, we actually, if you're new to the debrief show, we did episode 50 was another episode devoted really entirely to these nine different types. And we mm -hmm. walked through those things. That was before we're on video. So you can listen to it only. <laughs> uh, if you're new, go to debrief.show slash 50. So you can um, get another insight to that. But then we've also got the workshops coming up, which we would love for you to be a part of. So you can be uh, getting in on that self-discovery workshop mm -hmm. and right. learning more about who how God wired you to be in relationships. That's right. So we'll include a link to episode 50. We'll include a link to sandalschurch.com slash workshops all in our show notes, which are at debrief.show slash 78. I'll also throw links into those books that Justin talked about, about how to overcome struggles with pornography. We'll have all of that for you in the show notes. That's a great place to be full of resources from the show. So you don't have to try to write things down. I will find a book about how to overcome laziness and include that link in there as well for wow. Stephanie. Thank you. Can that you find one about fear also? <laughs> We'll throw some books in there that have helped yeah, us <laughs> and others uh, work through our issues. So you can also follow us at Debrief Show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll share some quotes from the show and things that you can share with your friends so that they exactly. can join you in listening to the Debrief because we know that you love it. And for those of you guys who are not a part of Sandals Church, we are so appreciative when you give to support what God is doing here and helping us produce the podcast. If you want to do that right now, bust out your smartphone, send a text message or your dumb phone. No, nah, it actually needs to be smart. You're going to get a URL. <laughs> you, you, you need to have a web browser on there. But uh, send a text message to give. Give debrief to 951-900-4120. Give debrief 951-900-4120. Your phone needs to be smart. You don't have to. Oh, I don't know. Is that a, could that be a tagline? That was a little yeah. insulting. Uh, mm. Yeah. Tammy, it was so awesome having you on the show again. I know. I think we're going to have you back really we soon, are. right? As We've we got an episode coming up in a few weeks to celebrate a very important milestone here Ooh. at Sandals Church. So we're going to bring Tammy years Brown of Sandals back. Church. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're going to yes. bring Tammy Brown back to talk. Incredible. About some history of Sandals Church and how Matt and Tammy have gotten us where we are today. Sandals so. Church, your most uh, cantankerous of children. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our second baby. Can I get, I want to give one last thought um, about all nine of these before we wrap up, especially mm. for the people who are listening who maybe don't attend or haven't heard it, is that as we're going through these, I'm sure there's some of you saying, oh, I have that. Oh, I also have that. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, um, most of us are going to experience some of these all the time in one way or another. What we're looking to do with this is for you to identify the most dominant, the primary way that maybe you um, are expressing yourself, the way that mm -hmm. the youest you comes out. Mm -hmm. So the way, you know, when you're looking at it going, oh, I, I struggle with fear too. I struggle with this. I struggle, you know. We're looking for the most primary way. The other ways, all of us are going to have some of these. All of them are attributes of God's and then the counterpart, which is the sinful way coming out. So so don't get super caught up when you know that you're identifying with more than one of them. Mm -hmm. Think of, you know, try to figure out the one that you feel like you most struggle with, mm -hmm. most identify with in, in that sense and, and take into account the way that we've kind of reshaped or broadened mm -hmm. these different, cause like for that one question, you know, they thought they were less, but I actually think it's, it's a, a seven, a gluttony, avoid pain kind of a, a situation. So re rethink of it that way, but mm -hmm. don't, don't get frustrated or lost when you think, well, uh, great. I have all of them. Mm -hmm. We're looking for you to identify the one that you most primarily display. Yeah. And I think what Pastor Matt said about how wisdom takes everything into account. Mm -hmm. Also don't ignore the ones that you're like, oh, I'm, that's definitely not me. Right. Like don't ignore those ones and move on. Cause I think this sermon has tons of wisdom on every one of those items mm -hmm. too. Just to make sure don't ignore the ones that you're like, oh, I don't struggle with pride at all. I yeah, and, and we, we've primarily in. focused on the negative side of these. Every one of these has a really positive and, and, they're, and they're very virtuous. And so. in the workshops, we yeah. will definitely spend time there because each piece of these, um, all of these are, like I said, like attributes of God that are displayed in us, like mm -hmm. just for lack of a better way to say, just like a mosaic of humanity 
Um, each needs the other counterpart. And so that's why we love this tool so much because each of these has such a beautiful side. We're just starting with this side because I think it's the easiest way to start Mm self-identifying. Boom, come to the real workshops at Sandals Church and find the U is to you.